the most popular Instagram account in the world, has an astonishing 434 million followers. Does the name Cristiano Ronaldo sound familiar? In case it doesn't, Cristiano is a Portuguese professional football player or soccer player for those of us in the United States. He plays forward for the Premier League Manchester United and he captains the Portugal national team. Here at Dog Podcast Network, we went on a hunt to find some of the most famous dogs on Instagram and we found Loki. He doesn't have 434 million followers, but he does have almost 2 million. Hello and welcome to The Long Leash. I'm James Jacobson. For today's episode, we pulled a never heard interview from our archives to bring you the story of Loki and his dog dad, Kelly Lund. This Instagram celebrity has a feed that is chock full of outdoor adventures with Kelly, Loki, and Kelly's girlfriend, Allie Cook. The photos and videos that they create are journal entries in a life that is well lived. Along with having over 1.9 million followers on Instagram, Loki has appeared in commercials for Toyota and Mercedes. Loki has inspired a premium line of CBD oils for dogs called Loki's Naturals. Kelly Lund's mission with Loki is to inspire people to get out, explore the world, and make memories with their dogs. In this episode, you will hear about Kelly and Allie's dog, Bailey, who is sick with cancer. We're sad to report that Bailey is no longer with them, but his memory lives on through Loki. Kelly Lund, thank you so much for joining us today. So let's first start out with the basics. Now, you are considered, uh, I don't know, an insta-famous, or actually the dog behind you, Loki, is considered famous. What does that mean, and, and how does one qualify for that? Man, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's definitely Loki. I I live in a shadow, kind of. And uh, how that qualifies, I have no idea. You know, I think it's all relative to when I, I remember when I was starting out and I got like 10,000 followers. And I thought that, you know, I grew up in a small town, less than 10,000 people. And I thought, oh my gosh, more than 10,000, more than the amount of people in my town are following Loki. And then, you know, fast forward, it just has become something I, I, I don't really know how to describe or I don't really think about too often as far as being Insta famous, but it's definitely what Loki is. He's definitely, I guess, one of the more famous dogs out there on Instagram. So kind of give us the genesis of this. How did this start? You didn't start out saying, I am going to be an Insta celebrity or my dog's going to be an Insta celebrity, did you? No, not at all. I started it when he was about a year old. I started Instagram and it just became kind of this game with me and some of my friends. They were kind of teasing me about starting an Instagram for him because my own Instagram had become all dog photos. And this was back in 2013. And it, it wasn't as common for people to have Instagrams for their dogs. And we just kind of started to kind of play this little game of can we take funny photos and can we take more creative photo today than we did yesterday? And that was kind of my own challenge to myself for quite a while, maybe a year and a half, I think. And then it started to gain a little momentum. We actually won a contest that GoPro had hosted, shooting some video. You had to submit video of your dog doing something cool with a GoPro. And we won. We were backcountry skiing. So thing that we've always done and kind of created a lot of content around is um, just filming him when we're backcountry skiing, him running kind of usually slow-mo in the snow. Later on that summer, I took a photo of him in a hammock sleeping like on my chest, coincidentally with a GoPro. So it was like kind of a selfie, selfie stick photo. And also around that same time, I put out a YouTube video of all of our snow footage combined into like a two minute video. And I think the combination of those two things got us noticed that that photo of him in the hammock went to the front page of Reddit, which I didn't even know what it was at the time. But uh, my neighbor texted me and said, hey, you're on the front page of Reddit. 
you know, I said, what's Reddit? Anyway, I think we had like 80,000 followers at the time. And within a day or two after being on Reddit, we had like 120,000 followers. And then a website called Board Panda reached out to us and wanted to write an article. And from there, BuzzFeed contacted us and wrote an article and all these different publications across the web. And within like four or six weeks, we went from having 80,000 followers to having 600,000 followers. Wow, that is quite a jump. But during this time, at least in the beginning, you still had a full-time job, right? Yeah, that was kind of, things just got so busy that I didn't have time to do both all the opportunities that were coming my way and also continue to work full-time. And one day I came into the office and I had been bringing Loki to work with me for probably a year or two previous to that, pretty much every day. And I worked for the city of Denver. So it wasn't something that, you know, understandably, you can't really bring your dog to it like a government job. You were in an office. Yeah, I was in an office. I worked for the outdoor rec department. So anyway, my boss said, hey, man, you know, some people higher up in the city got wind that Loki's like in the office every day and like, you can't do that. And he was like really bummed as well to even tell me that because he loved Loki and he would actually take Loki on walks every day. Anyway, so the next day I came back in, I just said, hey man, I quit. You know, I, I can't do this anymore. So I ended up staying for about six weeks to try to set them up and make sure that they could succeed without me. But that was kind of the, the kick that kicked me out the door. And that was in 2016. So I've been doing the opportunities that have come my way through photography and different things like that since then. So many people look at your success and say, yeah, I'd like to replicate that. How, how do I do that? Well, what advice would you give to someone like that? When people ask me, hey, how can I, you know, grow my Instagram? I kind of shrug. I'm like, honestly, it was outside of my talent skill. I mean, I, I responded to the opportunities that were there and I worked hard at it, but there wasn't anything that I did that was kind of some sort of trick to like explode Instagram. And I don't know how you could really replicate that today. I think it was just a perfect time in the history of the internet where people were interested in kind of a, it was really like a clickbait article that was replicated of us that was photocentric, a little bit of copy about us traveling together and me not leaving Loki behind in the backyard and all the things that we did. And it was just kind of a perfect moment where people started really devouring pet content. And yeah, it was just a, it was just a blessing, really, for me. I'm hearing you talk about the creative process the way an artist does. And when you started this, did you think of yourself as a creative soul? A little bit, yeah. It was definitely a creative outlet for me. I think the other thing is I really had to stay internal with my creative process. And I knew that as things grew, I'd get more and more outside influence and more and more influence of like just even my creative process of how I would think about photos before I would take them. For instance, that hammock photo, I, I dreamt that photo up before I went out and took it. And just staying internal and offering something that I think when you try to be creative, then it feels a little forced. But if you just kind of stay simple within yourself, I think sometimes for me, that's what led me to where I am today. My observation is that that's probably, that dog lovers are awfully good at detecting authenticity. And part of the authenticity that connects you with such a following is that they're able to see that this is a genuine, authentic relationship between you and Loki. Mm, yeah, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I definitely strive to be authentic. I'm kind of interested in to what extent your love of dogs is influenced by the creative process and how are dogs a part of that? Yeah, I think going back to that staying internal and staying kind of simple within myself, I've, I've had a love for dogs my whole life. We've had dogs, you know, from the time I was born all the way through, I'm almost 34. So I've had a dog, lived with a dog, had a dog all but two years of my life. And I think that connection that, kind of primal connection that you can have with a dog that is beyond words. And it's just 
something that's so hard to describe because there's no spoken language between us. So it's just a hard thing to describe. So I found myself being energized by portraying that through photos. Let's talk a little bit about what I call your dog bona fides. You said you grew up with dogs. Tell me about your first dog and what that was like. My first example of a real strong, like human to dog connection was my dad. He had a, we had an Australian shepherd named Ocker and they had a really tight relationship. Ocker was around before me and my brother were born. We also had a German shepherd named Stormy. We rescued a basset hound that ended up having a full litter of puppies that um, was, we weren't aware of when we picked her up off the road. Uh, we rescued an Akita. We later rescued a Rottweiler that became our dog. We had a couple of Rottweilers. When I was eight, though, me and my brother got litter mates, two sisters. They were Australian Shepherd mix. And they were a handful for, you know, an eight-year-old kid. You know, those dogs need so much stimulation. So needless to say, those weren't really the best behaved dogs. I wouldn't be so proud of my eight-year-old self of how I trained that dog. But either way, it's where I am today. And so I've had dogs all throughout my life. And in my early 20s, I had a husky. And then after that, I was so intrigued by wolf dogs, but I didn't know much about them. And I really went into it pretty ignorant, but I knew that if there was ever a time that I could tackle the challenge of, you know, raising a wolf dog, it would be now. And anyway, that's when I got Loki. So for our listeners who are not familiar, what is a wolf dog and what are the challenges? Yeah, wolf dog, also people call them wolf hybrids. They are a mix between some sort of combination between just a domesticated dog and a wolf. Both of those animals are the same species. They're both canines. And Loki's what's called the low content wolf dog. So he's more dog than he is wolf. So his mom was a full husky and his dad was a wolf and a Malamute. So he's, you know, theoretically 25% wolf. Yeah, the, the challenges are, are many. They can be very independent. They can run you know, escape from your backyard and things like that. Oftentimes, some of them want to be incredibly dominant within a pack of other dogs, and that can be challenging. They have a strong prey drive, just like any northern breed. Really, they have a strong prey drive. So, you know, cats or chickens or different things like that, you got to really be careful around them. So it's a big warning sign for people that want a wolf dog. They're so beautiful. And a northern breed in general, huskies, malamutes, all those types of dogs, they're so beautiful, but they require so much exercise, so much socialization, a strong leader. You know, you have to be a strong pack leader for them. So they're not for everybody. And oftentimes they end up in shelters and and, and whatnot. So they're something to not take lightly. Are you concerned or have you gotten any feedback from people who have been so inspired by your beautiful pictures of you and Loki and they aspire to that lifestyle and then they get a wolf dog and then go, that was a mistake? Yeah, definitely. You know, that conversation has been around since the time of Lassie, you know, and all throughout time of Lassie to White Fang to, you know, Beethoven. Anytime that there's a dog in pop culture, everybody wants that type of dog and It's definitely weighs on my heart and I definitely, there's two pieces of it. One, I don't want to get up on some soapbox and tell people that they're not good enough to have a wolf dog because that big part of the wolf dog community is basically talks like that, that nobody's good enough to really have them. And it's kind of sad to see all that negativity. So on the other side of that coin, I really just try to portray our life and what it takes to really restructure your life to have a dog like that, even, even a husky like that, which is a lot of exercise, a lot of getting them out, a lot of you know, letting them be free whenever it's safe and possible. I think it's very fitting and for our listeners who obviously are not able to watch this, we record this with video. It's beautiful. You're on the floor and Loki's on the couch. I just think <laughs> that it's like, that epitomizes the relationship. Now, Loki doesn't live alone. Loki has Bailey. Tell us about Bailey. Yeah, Bailey is 12 years old. He's a white German shepherd and he is was originally my girlfriend's dog and she's had him since he was a puppy. So all throughout her 20s, now into her 30s, 
And we've been together about three and a half years. And Loki and Bailey created a bond between themselves that's so strong. It's so tangible that it's been like the most incredible blessing in our life to really have a brother like that for him. So tell me about the dynamic of that relationship. I'm kind of curious. It sounds like you and Loki had a thing going on. Like you guys are like connected. And then all of a sudden, a woman and another dog come into the picture. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Early on when we started dating, we actually drove to Alaska. And so all four of us piled in the truck. We had all of our stuff and, you know, drove 10,000 miles to Alaska and back. And it was... I think the beauty of how all of us work as a team or a pack is the beauty of our life and their connection and our connection between all of us. And even just dating somebody who is on the same kind of wavelength as me, as far as taking care of their dog and prioritizing their dog in their life is a really cool thing. Did the pack order manifest like just magically or was there some compromise and negotiation? Between the two of them, Bailey has really always actually been boss. Up until a little bit more recently, Bailey is, he has cancer and he's had cancer for about two years and he's slowing down. He has started out as pancreatic cancer and moved to hermangiosarcoma. And as he slowed down, you can see Loki stepping up a little bit, even if it's with other dogs stepping in between them sometimes, maybe when the energy is just a little bit too much for Bailey or different little slight things like that. They really have a pretty balanced relationship where not one of them has ever really tried to dominate the other, but in just ever so slight ways, you can see Loki kind of stepping forward in ways. And as someone who has spent as much time focusing on dogs as you have, were you aware of the prevalence of cancer when Bailey got diagnosed? I noticed something was wrong with him one day when I went to get him in the truck. And he, like I said, he was very energetic early on in our relationship. And he would, so excited to get in the truck, so excited to go somewhere. And I kind of talked to him about going somewhere. I said, hey, man, let's let's get in the truck or let's go, want to go somewhere. And he wouldn't get off his bed. Pretty quickly, like within a day or two, I took him in to a vet and, you know, discovered that he had pancreatic cancer. Um, so it's, it's been a learning journey, but you said the prevalence of cancer. So within dogs in general. Yeah. I mean, one in three dogs gets cancer. One in two over the age of 10 get cancer. I I didn't know those statistics. We've had dogs that have had cancer, our Rottweiler did. And it's definitely, as he's gotten older, we always called him the Benjamin Button of dogs because he had such good energy really all the way up until right at this time. It's always in the back of your mind, you know, a German Shepherd, how long are they going to live? A larger dog in general, how long are they going to live? So yeah, definitely um, a little bit on edge about how long is he going to make it and whatnot. So it was heartbreaking news. And you shared that with your followers? Yeah, that's, that's a big part of our story and something that we kind of keep the followers updated on. People are so interested in, in the journey. People are so supportive and so grateful. People love Bailey so much. Even though he like doesn't have his own Instagram account, he's like the sidekick, you know? People are so supportive and that is such a blessing over the years. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's really tremendous to write down the update of what just happened or what's going on. And sometimes I think I can be a little bit too matter of fact about it because I just don't know how to... Um, it's so tremendous as is. So if I write and really express my emotions, I feel like it makes it even a little bit more tremendous. So it's a challenge. Allie's much better at it than I am about writing and about keeping people updated. In terms of anecdotes or stories about fans loving Bailey, do you have any more details on that? I'll tell you a story about Bailey. Allie made these pins, Bailey pins, and previous we had made Loki pins and we had raised money for a kid who had cancer, who needed a service dog. And we have some some friends that are in that space of kids with cancer. And so we raised money for a boy named Jack who needed a service dog. And we had these little pins made of Loki. Well, later on, that same family made pins of Bailey 
and donated them to us. And we used all that money to pay for Bailey's vet visits and his different surgeries that he's had and things like that. And since then, we've made more and, and they've always sold out really quick. The last batch that Allie put out, they sold out in four minutes. Wow. How many pins was that? I mean, this is not a handful of pins. That batch was a thousand pins. Wow. Story about Bailey. Sometimes we'll hear about people who meet, like there was a woman at a restaurant who noticed someone with a Bailey pin and the waitress also had a Bailey pin as well. And they like connected at that moment and had like a really touching moment that they both really love Bailey and just are kind of with him in heart. That is really great. Kelly, we're going to take a quick break right here. But when we come back, I want to ask you about some of the work that Loki does outside of posting on Instagram. We'll be right back. And now a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life. And the next, and the next, and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. We are back with Kelly Lund. So most of the time, it's he's familiar with the pack. It's you, your girlfriend, Bailey, and him, the four of you guys creating content. But when it involves a car commercial, I imagine that's a lot of people. How does Loki get along with all the, the production people associated with that type of an event? Yeah, it's been uh, all different. It's definitely exciting going in with that pressure. You know, I can't control him. You know, I can't control if he... And sometimes Loki has a tendency to get a little... Um, nervous you know that northern breed skittish time sometimes he's like that less and less over the years as he's gotten older but you know i never would know one time we were on a on a commercial actually a full-on set it down in, outside of la and we we're on this ranch and somewhere nearby in the mountains nearby was you could hear gunshots very very far away and he doesn't like gunshots and even though there was so quiet it still kind of tweaked him a little bit weirded him out a little bit so that's kind of like my worst nightmare is a situation like that, but it worked out okay. Do you ever work with handlers or any like professional dog wranglers? No. Um, when I was on that big commercial, there was, there was a dog handler there, which was to me kind of funny because they weren't like, they weren't really handling Loki. I was handling Loki. They were like just kind of standing there. And there was also a few people from like the Humane Society, which is cool. They bring people out and make sure that everything's copacetic. But really working with a trainer to train him to do something for something on camera, no. Never done anything like that. That's what I was going at. Because I imagine that, you know, you get a big ad agency, they're going to have all these things because that's what they do. And so, but Loki is pretty cool with, with all these people. Like, he adapts. Yep, yep. He's pretty adaptable. And, you know, again, back to that authentic piece, I think you just... He could only do what he could do, and we haven't really trained him to do anything spectacular. I bet you get, or Loki gets, some interesting fan mail. Some of the coolest stuff is art. You know, people 
make art of him. I actually have a box today that someone sent me. A 14-year-old girl emailed me and said, hey, I made a sculpture of Loki. I'd like to send it to you. And I haven't opened the box yet. So I'm excited to see that. We got uh, just before we hopped on this call. So I was going to ask about kids. So kids are definitely interested in Loki. Do you have a sense of who your demographic is? Who's actually makes up those millions of fans? Yeah, it's all over the place. You know, Loki even is a little bit of a fan favorite in our neighborhood. You know, some of the neighborhood kids, if they see us outside, will come over and want to pet Loki and sit down in the driveway and pet them, even though they've got their own dogs. But yeah, people all over ages and we've had some meet and greets and things like that where people have come out. It's really cool to see the audience. Obviously all all dog fans. Tell me about the meet and greets. You know, we did one here in Colorado that was a toy drive for a business that Ali was working for at the time. And people came out. There was a lady that came out who had actually flown out from Portland, Oregon for the meet and greet that night, which was cool. I was so honored to meet her and, and that she'd come out for that. But man, people just love to share stories about their dogs and share how Loki has touched their life. And it's so cool to meet people. It's, a, it's weird. It's unique to meet people who spend so much time with Loki without us having spent time with them. And that's a weird thing, but it's also a very cool thing because there's even people in my own life that I feel that same way, whether it be someone, a podcaster or you know, somebody that I follow on Instagram. To me, I spend so much time with them because I listen to their podcast every week or whatever. So just respecting that and just grateful to be in people's lives like that. How have you changed during this odyssey with Loki? I don't know. There's been a lot of ups and downs. You know, social media is a blessing and it's a curse. You know, how distracted you can be by it and how hard it is to be present in everyday life when you're always thinking about things going on online and having to attend to different things and so many conversations and things like that that are not in this like physical world that's around me. Um, that's been a challenge, you know, and that's been something to learn and grow through. And you touched on something that's resonating with me that's making me think, and that's sort of the role of social media. I think a lot of people would argue that social media has some destructive habits to it, has some very addictive habits, kind of gets people to just, you know, spend a lot of time screen time when really what your channel is really all about is going out and being active and celebrating life with your dog. I think that is so true. That juxtaposition between those two concepts is like, it's such a dichotomy between how much time do I spend online compared to how much time am I inspiring people to just get outside. Uh, I haven't always handled it good. You know, I've always, I'm sure my screen time has been through the roof at times compared to the national average, you know, of person. So I'm not like some sort of shining example of like, post something and then that's the only time I'm on my phone that day. I can mindlessly scroll like anyone else. Do you think that people are vicariously living through you or through the depiction of the lifestyle that you and Loki lead? Yeah, I think they do. I hope that we're relatable in ways of just the fact that we are, you have a dog and so many people in America have a dog. And also I hope that we're inspiring by some of the things that we do or places that we go. And for people to get out and, you know, I've heard stories of people saying, hey, I, I'm on my first camping trip and you've really been a big part of inspiring me to like get out or I'm on my first road trip. You know, we're big on road tripping and kind of everything that goes along with that. So I hear a lot of that, a lot of stories about that, which is cool. Well, you have certainly inspired us here at DPN. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Kelly, and sharing Loki and Bailey and Allie and your story with us. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you. If you'd like to see some of the amazing pictures of Loki, we will have the link to his Instagram account in today's show notes. Also, please check out the audio postcards that we created of Loki's Instagram feed on our sister show, Dog Edition. The episode Back to Nature with Our Dogs features Loki and Kelly as they canoe across an alpine lake and set dreams aflight in a campfire and chase jackrabbits. On that episode, we also welcome our new Dog Edition co-host, Claire Mansell, 
and you can play along as Claire challenges me to a celebrity guessing game called Who Has More Followers? Is it Loki or... Well, I'll let you listen and find out some pretty big names. It's a fun game. Check it out on Dog Edition, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. And there's a link to that episode in today's show notes as well. Thank you so much for hitting the play button and spending a little time with me today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell a friend or two about The Long Leash. All the links are on our website at longleashshow.com. Well, I'm going to get out of here and go out and make some Loki-inspired adventures with my dog. Until next time, I'm James Jacobson, wishing you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.